Thank you, Bill. Welcome, everyone. We've got an absolute treat tonight, and um, let's hope we can have a fabulous uh, conversation uh, with David and Alan. Um, Arnold Mitchell, David's dad, absolute legend at this club. More appearances than any other player that's ever played for City. Um, played here between 1952 and 1966, so an immense period of time. Um, and Alan Banks, um, played here for a decade between 63 and 73. A little, little wandering off somewhere that we won't mention. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to mention it very much, but we might have you on it a bit later on. Um, so we, we'll uh, really enjoy um, hearing about that, that period um, from the 50s to the 70s, really. Um, it's incredibly timely, this meeting. Um, as, as you know, we've now got the next to City History Group looking to uh, build the heritage of, uh, of the club. And we've had fantastic news this month that the Heritage Lottery Fund has given us um, a sizable amount of money to research the history of St James's Park. We thought it would be timely with the old grandstand probably going. Uh, it hasn't been publicly announced yet because there were elections on and they can't make the announcement, so it will be a public announcement about it sometime in May. But this is really the first gathering um, uh, since that announcement, so we'll be keen during the meeting if people have got memories and and David as well about um, what St James's Park meant to Arnold and, and to you, Alan, and to you as people who have come here over so many years. So we'll weave that in as well. But let's let, let's kick off, and um, I'm going to do it chronologically. So um, Arnold was here before you, Alan. So, 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 <laughs> David, <laughs> so David gets to back first. So um, David, you were born in 1959. Yes. So you were a little boy when Exeter City, for the first time in its history, ever got promoted. Uh, took, took us a long time to get there, over 60 years to, to actually do it. So, can, can you just tell us your boyhood memories of, of being the son of a legend? Uh, I can always remember being brought to the ground as a, as a young lad by my mother Julie, my mother Julie, and uh, they'd just finished a training session. And I think they used to train behind the big bank. You had a goal there, didn't you? You used to have a kick about uh, on, on the waste ground, as it was. Uh, and I can always remember, as soon as they finished training, Dad would make a beeline for the Georgian Dragon in Blackboy Road. I think George Milford was the landlord at the time. And uh, Dad used to spend many a happy hour in there with George, playing darts, um, and obviously socialising, smoking. Dad was quite a, a big smoker. And uh, he'd walk over there, have a few pints, and then they'd venture down to the bookmakers in Civil Street, where Julie and Jill's dad used to manage the day pipe yeah, the bookmakers. Yeah. Um, they'd study the form, they'd place a few bets, <laughs> and then, lo and behold, they'd make their way down to the Greyhound in Civil Street, where they'd have lunch. <laughs> and I think many happy moments spent in there, especially with Jack Edwards, the manager, and they used to use current sets, salt pepper sellers, and just discuss, discuss tactics over a few beers in, in the Greyhound. And that was a regular occurrence for them. That was almost like a regular routine that Dad used to get into. Um, my memories as a little lad, I can always remember um, doing that with him. But Dad was always very nervous before a match, whether it was home or away. I can remember as a little lad on a Saturday lunchtime, he'd sort of groom himself and stand in front of the mirror, combing what hair he had left. <laughs> and uh, always wore collar and tie. Always wore his Exodus City blazer badge on his blazer with a PFA tie. But he only ever had a piece of toast for his breakfast. He never, never ate anything more on match days. But what he used to always have, to keep his weight down especially, and he was, I think he was about 11 stone dripping wet anyway, he was always very lightweight, he used to always used to have a, a, a raw egg and a glass of sherry. And that's how he used to keep his weight down. And I, I can't imagine modern day players sort of eating and drinking and pouring in a glass of sherry. Um, Dad never drove, he never sat behind the wheel of a car in his life, and I can remember him walking, he would never take the bus, he'd always walk along Prince Charles Road from Beacon Heath where he lived, to the ground, or I think in later years he used to get picked up by a goalkeeper called Colin Tinsley, that used to live up near Mike in Fox Road, 
and also a guy called Brian, a player called Brian Whitnell that used to live locally in Home. Yeah. Um, so Dad always used to walk to games, um, and, and I've got very fond memories as a, uh, you know as a, as a young lad. Um, I used to come up from the age of three and sit on my mother's knee. And unfortunately, she used to sit right next to Headley <laughs> in the grandstand, and he used to terrify me. The <laughs> constant shouting and obviously foul and abusive language from time to time. <laughs> so I was really weaned on it from a young age, and of course, the house was always full of uh, Exeter City players, past and present, from sort of the early 50s, that used to come up and see Dan on a regular basis. So I say, Dan was quite, um, he always smoked, and in his early days up here, um, as I say, he used to get very nervous before a game. He'd always light a cigarette before kickoff, and he'd nip it and he'd put it on top of the cistern in the toilet. But he always used to finish it at half time. And, and, and latterly, as, as a young lad, I can remember he had a pipe rack and he always had a pipe on the go. Always smoked a pipe indoors. Uh, I remember in those days we had a coal fire and he always used to uh, spill and light his pipe from the coal fire. So my memories really are, are, are fairly limited on the playing side. But I can remember, as I just said to you earlier, um, meeting him at St David's Station um, after their nil-nil draw at Workington, where both sides needed a point to get promoted to the, uh, the then third division. Um, and all I was interested, Dad always used to bring me back a Corgi car from his ventures away from home. And there's a picture there of the lads getting off the train on the station. Um, there, that's the one. And Alan's in the photograph as well there. And Headley's on the corner here, gentleman there. Um, Les Anderson, is it? Yeah, yeah Les Anderson. Les Anderson. Norman Bourne, who was, who was a teacher of mine at Hill School, maths teacher. I think that's him there as a young lad. I think his grandfather was a director. Yeah, I think he was, yeah. Um, and there's me right at the front, and all I was interested in really was what Dad had in his hole for me. <laughs> and he ha happened to bring back a, a corgi low loader with a digger on it, and I've still got it. Oh. And I'm going to give that to the club because I think that might be quite a relevant thing to put in the display cabinet. But those are my memories. Um, obviously, he was my dad, uh, first and foremost, and I think it's only in sort of later life that you. Um, realise and understand what maybe he meant to the people of Exeter, like, like Alan still does. I mean, yeah, right. I've always said that they were, they were legends of their time, but they were legends who played with other legends. Mm. Legend, the word legends used an awful lot these days, but these were what I call working class heroes, men of the people. Mm. They'd walk down the street, they'd stop and have a drink, and Dad used to buy everybody a drink. He was always known for his hospitality. Uh, he squandered thousands on the horses and thousands on wine drinks. Oh, yeah. um, but you, they, they were all approachable guys, and um, they didn't jump in their Bentleys at the end of the game and go home. They used to frequent the local hostelry, uh, um, hostelries yeah. and, and buy the lads drink, didn't you, Alan? You used to go on our bikes. <laughs> so, Alan, share a bit about what Arnold Mitchell meant to you. Um, I first, met, I first met Arnold when I first signed. And we were playing away at, um, let me debut at Tramia. And it was a Monday evening game. And I had to, um, I, I, when I signed uh, from Cambridge, I, um, I went to Liverpool and stayed with my parents and then went from uh, Liverpool to Tramia. No, went from, uh, there to South because they were staying overnight. The club, the club, had played Barrow on the Saturday, and then went from Barrow to Southport to stay uh, over over the weekend. And I, I went then to uh, to Southport to meet up with the players because I, obviously I, I just signed, didn't know anybody at all, and uh, we were they were all staying in a hotel in Southport. And the uh, first person I met, obviously, was Jack Edwards, the manager. And then he introduced me to Arnold, the first person I met. Very approachable chap, and, you know, I had a very little chap. And then I was introduced to, uh, to the rest of the players. Then on the Monday evening, we went to Tramia, and obviously we got beat 2-1. Uh, but it was only after the game, during the game, and after the game, and Arnie was bald as a brat. 
Den nehmen wir die schon mal so. Das ist mal logisch. But Arnold was an outstanding, fantastic player. I mean, not only was he a, a terrific player, but he was a, a real captain and very approachable. He could be, he can have words with you on the pitch, but once the game was over, that was it, finished. You just became friends. But he was, an army was the sort of a person that any up and coming young boy wanted to look after Arnie was the person. And, I, and I, I said to David, for me, I, I would say he was the best player I played with. I would say that. Yes, just just kind of, thank you. Yeah, just did, did, he tell me, did he shout at you a lot? Because I can always remember. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, Dad, Dad never spoke, even at home, he shouted all the time. And he's known for it, he never stopped shouting. He shouted on the pitch all the time. But as I said, once the game was over, that was forgotten. Mm -hmm. He just acted normally. Yeah. So, what, what about for you, though, that actually remember seeing Arnold play? What, what did he mean to you as, as, as fans? Well, he was definitely the, he, uh, like I said, Arnold wasn't like Alan, an instant success when he got to the club from the league ground. And he grew into the club and they made a positional change from when he went to halfback. And that was amazing. He, he was a, well, he was a different player. That's the His thing first that. season here, he played on the right wing. Yeah, he played on the right wing. He played on the right wing. And, and he know, scored 10 goals. I don't think I was thinking we would be retained that season yeah. and all this. But, so he wasn't, like, Alan, when he came here, I heard people say, oh, we've got this new fullback from Cambridge. Oh, all action. Oh, you want to see it. And, like, Alan, you've been a success right from the start. And I, I've told you before, my dad reckoned that you was the best player he saw since Al Gowden in the sixth round of the cup. He went to the sixth round of the cup, and he come from your rivals of Everton. Happy happy. And, and happy. Alan, Alan had come from Liverpool. But I mean, my dad had been a supporter right from, I mean, when you were pitch room, he's a boy in 1911, right, watching him play Oracle. So he knew a bit about football. And, and, you know, like I say, Arnold, but well, any, like any but our age, or Arnold, everybody knew, even no. Arnold was at the city. He was joint second top scorer. He was joint second top scorer in his first season, and he played on the right wing. And I think he returned ten goals. Um, and they put him on the transfer list at the end of the season. And I've given the club. I've actually got copies of um, a letter from George Gillen, who was then the chairman of Torquay United Football Club, and he owned the Belgrave Hotel. And he found out that Dad was being transfer listed after his first season, and he asked him to get in contact with him ASAP to sign for Torquay United. I've also uh, given the club a telegram from Norman Dodgen, who was the manager. Dad had returned home to Rotherham, and Norman Dodgen had sent him a telegram the day before uh, Dad, or the letter turned up at Dad's uh, front door from, uh, from George Gillen, requesting Dad to jump on the first available train to come back and resign. So without those letters, and there's also a letter there from four concerned Exeter City fans, which I think is in the collection that I've given you, requesting that, don't get rid of Arnie, put him in a different position, in a different row, playing at half, half right half. Which well, they're, the ones that did. they're the ones that changed his mind, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone, anyone else remember Arnold playing? I came right at the end of his career. He started about 65, 6 from the first full season I started watching. So, so. It was him and Keith Harvey who were rock in the centre of the defence. I just remember about Batman did have a big defence. Well, I think they made over a thousand games for a thousand performance support. I think I think it's yeah. yeah. just yeah. and Keith in total that I think they made over twelve hundred appearances for the club. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think I think Keith signed a month after Dad in fifty two. I think Dad made his debut in July and, and uh, oh not July, sorry, in August and, and Keith a bit later, but they signed roughly at the same time. Of course, he was a local lad from Crowley oh, anyway, along with Fred Davey, who was already here. Um, and he was Dad's best man, uh, Fred Davey. They were sort of a little community within within the club, as it were. But uh, I think without Keith getting injured, I think he had sustained a broken leg. Yeah, Keith did, yeah. Um, he lost quite a few games through, through serious injuries. Dad was very fortunate. I think he had knee ligament damage and missed a few games 
um, in, in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. But I think without that, Keith would probably gone on to have made over 600 appearances for the club. Uh, and he's always been a dear friend of the family anyway. And, um, you know, again, one of the good old guys of, of Exeter City, really. They, they, were, they, they formed the basis and the foundation of that team, that promotion running team. And Alan came along after about 15 or 16 games when you signed, and you were very prolific, weren't you, at Cambridge? Yeah. I came in, I came in October, in October 16, yeah. 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 October 16 yeah. yeah. And you immediately, well, you, you hit the back of the net, you started scoring from day one almost, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scored on me, my third game, and that was against, um, my first home game was against, uh, I think it was Halifax, we got beat 1-0. And then my third game, we went to um, Oxford United, and where we won 2-0, and David Curtis and myself school. And that's when, um, Dermot and I got a, a tremendous understanding between us, you know, Dermot was, he was getting to the end of his career, David, but he was still a good player. And the thing about David was, I would say he's the best ever of a ball this club's ever had. He was unbelievable. He wasn't the tallest of people. He was about five foot nine, stocky, but by Christ, could he jump? Mm -hmm. You like he just had that springs in his heels, and he was he was up. Unbelievable, and, and yeah, you know, and what, why I got on so well with them it was, when I played at Cambridge, I played with another set of four men, from very similar to him, and we, we, we had a, we had a great understanding, and then I, I, then I, it just, I just carried on from Cambridge, and then I played with them, and it was just as if, you know, I thought, of course, I'm still playing against City, yeah? No, God. Mm -hmm. But I was like, it. it was, we had a tremendous understanding, you know? And this is why, I mean, when I, strikers, I always say, you play in players. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen here. We've got a big centre forward <coughs> over the last few games in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. He's winning everything in the air, but he's no, not, right. not, yeah. not getting yeah. any support from mm -hmm. anybody else from at all. So, so, so why not balls up to Stockholm when well, he's got that? He's got no, absolutely no support at all. And it's not rocket science. If the manager's on the bench, surely he could see what's happening. I think once last night, Watkins got maybe five yards to stock him. And he knocked it down, and unfortunately, Watkins lost the ball, got stuck in between his feet, and it was clear. That was the only time last night that we got together. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I, 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 and I honest, honestly felt really sorry, sorry for him on Saturday. He's our man of the match. What with quarter of the match ago? Man, he takes him off. Crazy. Interesting talking about Dermot Curtis just as an aside. We, we've just um, uncovered some YouTube footage of Dermot scoring against England for the Republic of Ireland. <laughs> and absolutely thumping header. And it's, it's wonderful because it's, it's actually a Russian version, so everything's in <laughs> Russian. <laughs> it's really <laughs> cool. yeah, it's English. Yeah, it absolutely buries it to the back of the Doesn't he? He uses his neck muscles. Yeah. Can I just put. David mentioned uh, a Mr. Gillen. Now, who had the hotel in, 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 in Torquay. And he was the main person that got me to sign for Exeter City. Because the, the chairman of Liverpool at that time, a Mr. A T. B. Williams, used to go to Mr. Gillen's hotel every summer. And when uh, I, I tried to Looper wouldn't let me go, because I was still in the contact there, but I was still playing for Cambridge. And Mr. Gillen, I got hold of Mr. Williams and asked him, is there any chance of you trying to release me to South Exeter? And that's, that's what happened. 
It was only through him that I signed up. He was passionate about his football, though, wasn't he? Because he was, he was talking not to Chairman Price to come in. He was, so yeah, but at that, that, that time, it was a direct and a better decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Alan, you, you come here in uh, October 63, yeah. and it must have seemed easy to you. There you are, your first season promoted. Extra started out in, you know, turn of the turn of the 20th century and taken 63 years to do it. What, why did you get promoted that season? What was the ingredients in the team? What, what did you... Uh, we, had, um, we had good players. But we played to the system. And we played it home and away. We got promoted purely uh, because of one person. That was the manager. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, we, we had no facilities at all for training. When I first came, and I came, my first, my first day training, we got a coach outside St. James of Road, and he told us to bottom feed us. That was, yes, the public park. Mm. We literally had no Actually, no, no facilities at all. When it rained and we couldn't go there, we used to we lapsed around the ground, run up and down the big bank, run down uh, what, what was the cow shed, and that was that was just our training. We couldn't go on the pitch because Sonny Clark wouldn't let us go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's that's what it was like. And as David said, the only piece of grass we had was behind the big bank. It had a full size goal with a sand pit. Mm -hmm. And we used to just have the shooting practice. But, but didn't the obviously know with the talk about them building flats here to you know, yeah. hopefully fund the new grandstand, yeah. didn't the club try and sell that land for a 10, ten lane bowling alley and no. the council turned it down back in their door? Yeah. I think in the 60s, early 60s, you know, even then they were looking to try and make money here and you think, yeah. well, that was the only strip of land that you had that you could get the ball on. Referring back to the, uh, to the year we got promotion, as I said, it was only through Jack Edwards. I mean, we played to a system. We could, we could play 4-4-2 or we could play 4-2-4. We could play 4-2-4 when we had the ball. But when we didn't have the ball, we had 4 4 2. Two wingers used to come in on the by line, five yards, make it fall across the park. Didn't they used to call it the W formation and the N formation? No, that was the W formation in the olden days. Right, before Alan. Yeah, before you. Not the W formation. But you played 4 4 2. We played that all, all the time, home and away. Because we, the reason being, we had two wingers, we had Gray and Reese. And we had Adrian Thorne, who were both quick. I mean, and when we had, you know, nine times out of ten, if we had a balls not to either Graham or Adrian down the line, get crosses in, in the penalty. Mm -hmm. But when we didn't have the ball, if they had goal kicks, they would come in five yards and made them fall across, fall in the middle of the park and leave them at night. It was simple. So, so how did you feel then when, I think, the, didn't the club bring in um, Ellis Scottard as, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he came from Plymouth Argyle and yeah. he was appointed as Chief Scout well, without, he was appointed Chief Scout, without Jack knowing about it, without Jack Edwards knowing about it, goodness me, Darryl Hicks never told Jack at all, and uh, after about three weeks, Jack said, I've had enough. And, 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 we, and he resigned. Adrian Thorne, we had signed him from Plymouth Argyle. And I was good friends with Adrian, because he, he got chewed out of his sticks and lived with me and my wife at once. <laughs> <laughs> and when he heard that Ellis Thorne was going to become a manager, he said, I'm telling you now, he said, from the end of the season, no, when, when, he, when he became Chief Scout, Adrian said, I'm going to tell you now, he'll be the next, he'll be the next manager. He said, and if he becomes manager, I'll be gone by the end of the season. And that's what I tell him. Because didn't the club make him temporary manager when Jack 
he took umbrage, didn't he, to his appointment because he wasn't informed about him being made oh, chief yeah, of staff. Yeah. And then, but the club made Ellis Sluthard temporary manager. Oh, and, then, yeah. and then at the end of the season, they appointed him. No, 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 no. Jack yeah. Levitt, um, before the end of the season. Yeah. And as you said, Jack Levitt. Oh, Jack Levitt, yeah. Ellis, <laughs> Ellis Sluthard was made temporary manager when, when, when Jack went, and then they made him full time manager. Time, yeah. But why did they make him full time manager from Chief Scout? No idea. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's what actually happened. That's what actually happened. Well, success. Why? Why did you that? So, as, as fans, thinking back to that promotion season, did did you think as the season started to unfold that some, this was this was going to be a different year, or was it a bit of a surprise when it started happening? <laughs> Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I know it's embarrassing, but as soon as Alan come, there was, there was, there was all, because we had so many who scored goals. I mean, you know, like you say, we won a terrific goal scoring team, I don't think that, but they had a very good defensive record, and we drew a lot of matches away from home, which, you know, it's, it, as a supporter, of course, in those days, it was only two points to win, wasn't it? And yet, so no, it was not. Yeah. But uh, no, it was. It, it was in but Dad always said that the biggest mistake the club made was that they were talking about going up into the second division before they consolidated in the third. And that was one thing that really riled him, because the directors were all about, oh yeah, we're going to get promoted the following season. And they didn't build on the success they had getting promoted from the fourth. But uh, Jack Edwards, Dad, uh, he was a similar sort of age to him. He wasn't that much older than Dad, was he, Jack? But, um, they got him like a house on fire because they were. He was. He was. A, I mean, he was. A, he was a modern thinker, wasn't he? Yeah. I mean, Jack. Jack Edwards, along with John Newman, are probably the two best managers as far as I'm. I would put. I would put uh, Jack just slightly in front of uh, John, purely on the basis that. When Jack was manager here, he literally had no help. I'm saying no help. He was manager, he was trainer, he was coach, he was physio, he was kick man. He had six, Jack literally had six jobs. He had literally no help at all from anybody within the club. Honestly, it was, it was, it was Jack was unbelievable. And when all, did he become manager then? Well, what year was that? Well, so he was Spires, Sue Spires, Sue Spires, Sue Spires. Spires. Yeah. He was an ex-Totten goalkeeper. I think he was manager at Crystal Palace, and, and Jack Edwards came from Crystal Palace. Oh, he was captain of Crystal he, Palace. He, it was, it was a and he played about 230 games for Crystal Palace, and he was their captain. And I think the city manager brought him to the club, yeah. and he became um, a, a, a coach, a player coach, I believe, initially, and then they made him. And they got rid of, I think Jack replaced him, they sat Cyril, and then Jack took over, uh, stepped into his shoes, and then it just went through. Was that the season before the promotion season when Jack took over? Or was it not before? Before the season before? Six. Before the promotion season, I think Jack took over, I thought. But what, he, what, he, what he did, I, I see to see, I don't know if it was at that time, the player you haven't mentioned was a player of limited ability, I thought, called Derek Grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he used to do, very simple game. You know, a lot of people were good at either of them, but it was the first time I've ever seen a player playing the front line who used to drop back in front of the midfield yeah. and so it would stabilise the midfield area. One more ball for you guys to use on. You see, the system we played was quite, was, was quite easy actually. We had, I thought we had two full backs, we had Seth Smith and Les McDonald, mm -hmm. and we had Keith Harvey second half. Mm -hmm. When we kicked off, De Des Anderson is playing the midfield. They used to drop just behind uh, Keith Army. Mm -hmm. And then we had we had Army and then we had um, Derek Grace mm -hmm. and we had uh, Dave Hancock. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so when we, we, then we had we had, we had the two wings. When we didn't have the ball, Derek used to just drop in the middle of the park. That's right. And then he, he made the ball. That's right. I think that's what stabilised the goals, the goals against. Yeah, I mean, mm. Derek was, Derek, he was only a youngster. Mm. He came from, uh, came from London. Mm. 
and uh, he was only in his early 20s, mm. but a good player. But he could run, one of those people, mm. he could run all day long. <coughs> you know, and, uh, but you know, that, that side was the best side I've ever played in. I'm, I'm fascinated, at, uh, particularly with um, the, the work we're, we're doing now on the history of the ground, that, that so much training took place at the ground. Because yeah. that's a whole that's different dimension yeah. to Because now nobody would go anywhere near well, it. I think occasionally they used to go out to George Warren and run down the sand dunes back in the 50s. <laughs> but that was like a day trip away for them. They had nowhere to train. They used to go up to Pennsylvania, up to the university site, and they used to go on runs up Reefords Lake. But that's all they used to do. There's no Not all of them used to go around up. Some of them used to sit on the sea. They come back and they were doing all the other groups. Yeah. 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 I just met yeah. Anne Jory McClellan. <laughs> when John Jones became manager, then we started, they got in touch with the Exeter University, and then we started to use their facilities. In pre season, we used to go to the, the, train, the, the pitches down at Sandman Pool Lane. Yeah. And then when it was, um, and the weather was bad, we could use the, uh, the sports hall. We used to play five sides and they had the weightlifting rooms down there. So it was only when John Newman became manager and along with uh, Bert Edwards, who was the trainer, that um, they, they got at least some continuity, you know, and more experience to uh, facilities we could use. What were your diets like in, in later years then, in, in, in the sort of 70s, early 70s? Did you train, you didn't eat pasta and chicken, you fillet steak on a Saturday? Yeah, or steak and a couple of pints. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, Alan, did you used to run up and down the big bank and oh, yeah. take it behind? Everybody used to do it. Everybody had to, we did, yeah. I mean, it was just so what would be, if, if you were training here, you changing the changing rooms? Oh yeah, yeah. Changing, changing rooms. Yeah. And then what, what would be the training regime? And well, I mean, what, what would happen is they would have running down the track. They would, they would do it into sort of sprints, and then one group then would be running up the bank, and then uh, then then they would change around. So the people running up the bank would be on the track, and the track would be running up the bank. But I mean, well, what else could you do? Mm -hmm. Especially if you weren't allowed on the pitch. No, no, oh, something like right. oh. <laughs> It was a nightmare, something. A nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he couldn't let you on the pitch at all. No, that was, his, that was his manner. Really. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, but he was well respected here, though, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Right. he was a character. Yeah, he had a testimonial. Did he need a testimonial from him? Or benefit match for Sonny? In the 70s? Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. the nice thing about Sonny is, when he passed away, it was amazing how many of the ex-players went to live with him. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. When he retired here, he took up wine making. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> took up wine making. Yeah. He had hands. He had hands like shorts. No, no, no. Absolutely. So, talk, talk about the running. To, to when, when we got promoted, what, what your memories, and then maybe any, anything you could remember um, or what you did. Because it, was, it wasn't a given that you were going to get no, promoted, no, no. was it? The only time I knew when I thought we had a chance of going on, and it was Boxing Day in 63. I was still living in Cambridge, and I got a little friend of mine to a hotel in London, but the latter's, but they travelled uh, Christmas Day, I stayed in London. And I travelled from Cambridge on Christmas, on Boxing Morning to London to meet up with the players. And we were playing Brighton away. And um, that, that was at the old, the old ground, the Goldstone ground. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, we we're, were getting beat one nil at half time. I mean, we were playing all right, we were playing fine. And Jack had said, he said, just sit yourselves down. He said, listen, if you carry on playing the way you are, you're going to win this. Can't say enough. And we did. Adrian, Adrian Thorne, who actually played for Brighton, mm -hmm. scored the equaliser. And about three minutes from the end, I crossed the winner. And we won 2-1. And it was 
that game, and I thought to myself, we've got a chance here, we've got enough. And, and, and that's a and that's fact we did. That, when I first came, we, we lost the first two games I played in. And then uh, I think it, the, out of the next 24 games, I think we only got beat, I think, maybe no more than three times. That's what we need to know. You drew a lot of games that season, didn't you? 1-1 one, one and 0-0? Nil, nil. Well, we did. Uh, yeah, we did. It was based yeah. on solid defence, good out yeah. back line, and then used to bang them in at the other end, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think I, I can remember, I think if my memory serves me right, Father missed eight of the last ten games. And I've never known to this day. Yeah. He played inside left, and then he didn't play for, I think, seven or eight games. And I've never known whether or not he was dropped, or whether or not he was injured. Oh. And he played in the final game at Workington. Yeah. He yeah, missed yeah, seven or eight games yeah, prior to that. Uh, yeah, 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 I don't think so. I don't think yeah, I, I checked the records and I thought, yeah. why did he miss? He played 36 games, uh, sorry, 38 games of the 46 in the season, but he missed eight out of the last 10 games. Yeah, and he, and he, never, he never told me why, and I've always wanted to find out whether or not he was dropped or whether or not he was injured for those, but he came back for the final game of the way at Workington because you both needed a point to go up, didn't you? I found my heart to believe to be honest with you. Yeah, I do. I've checked it over and I thought, he's have missed. You, have you read? Have you well, yeah, I've got I've got watched, watched, I've got Mike Black's old book? Yes, yeah. And it's, it's, in, it's in all books, in all records. He missed eight of the last ten games. I, I've never known why. I thought you were going to invite me out of <laughs> No, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> because Dave Hancock, Dave Hancock um, I think the game, the last game he played before the final game away to Workington when the club needed a point to go up, he was switched to play inside left number 10. And Dave Hancock, who was signed from Torquay, because he was an excellent, went to Hills Grammar School. Um, he played uh, those eight games that Dad missed. He played at right half number four. And I, I've always wondered to this day whether or not Jack dropped him deliberately or whether or not Dad was injured. I would have thought so. We played all the other games apart from those, except the very final game of the season. I find hard to believe. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've looked at it and it, and it, it shocked me because he, he never told me, he never spoke about that at all. Yeah. Yeah. To check the news. Yeah. And, and I know that he had knee ligament trouble from time to time, cartilage trouble, but I, I just wonder why <laughs> Dave Hancock took his position at right half. And I've looked at I've looked every record I can find, and it's, it's eight of the last ten games, and it's only the final game of the season away to Workington that he, he, he skipped at the side. So tell us about the working team. The whole thing going up there because I talk well, about it, it, hardly a local game. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it was one of the few trips we went by train because we never ever went. I think the only that year, I think the only times we went by train one was to uh, Newport County and the other one was for um, Wellington. And in, in actual fact, I um, I shouldn't have played in the game. Be honest with you, because I've been suffering with a bad, with a bad shoulder, and uh, on the Saturday mo uh, on the Saturday morning, I I went out of bit the steps at Carlisle United ground before the game, and I because about three games from the end from the end of the season, I damaged my shoulder. We played at uh, Chesterfield, and we won one 0 When I scored, I fell over and damaged by uh, my shoulder. Then the following, that was in midweek, then on the Saturday we were playing Harvard City here, and I wasn't fit to play, and we, we lost it, and we got beat 3-2. Yeah. And then we had a midweek game against Chesterfield, Chesterfield. We won 6-1. We won 6-1, and I, I played, but I, I was still in the middle. And that was only when we went uh, up to Wellington. I had a, had a fitness test in the morning at Carlisle. So did you stay overnight in Carlisle? Oh yeah, we stayed at, uh, just outside Carlisle, just outside uh, Wellington. Yeah. Um, and did you all behave yourself the night before? We were all our best behaviour that night. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, I I did, what, what would you do? Have a meal together? Or? Well, I mean, normally uh, those days, it was. Playing away from home, uh, we would probably go after dinner and go in 
um, after that go and have a walk, stretch the legs and that, you know. Uh, some number go back to the hotel and some of us went there, um, <laughs> go to the nearest pub. Maybe we to relax. To relax, we need to have a couple of pints and get a dance. Mm -hmm. But that was the culture. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like in those days. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, and of course when we go back to the hotel, you know, we go back and go to bed, get up the next morning, have breakfast, then go back up to the, to the ground. And of course when we got to the ground at Wakington, I mean, it was absolutely full of city supporters. Absolutely. Hundreds of them, thousands of them. Yeah, you know. Yeah. They'd come from one part of the, one end of the country to the other, you know. But it was, it was really fantastic. And of course, at the end of the game, it was never nil, and obviously, both sets of supporters were onto the pitch. So both teams got promoted? Yeah, they got promoted as well as us. And uh, of course, we got into the dressing room, and obviously, the Wigton directors had bottles of champagne and everything else. And we were, we had to go back to the hotel uh, for dinner before we got the train back. And when we got the, the ship, I made a massive cake. Congratulations, mm -hmm. promoted, you know. <laughs> Yeah. He was hoping that yeah. otherwise he's going to have a cake on his head. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You could have had him nearly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, you know, I went, um, my God, did, didn't I have, have some drink? Jesus. Well, that, that actual game, was it played a bit cagey? Were they don't score, we won't score? Sort of yeah, thing? it was like, like that. I mean, they had a good, good defensive record, yeah. and we had a good defensive record, so it was a case of. Don't try too hard when you get yeah, to the yeah. 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 That's what we have said, What I mean to say is... Um, and did you stay up there again? No, when did you come back? We came back, uh, could have... Got back into it. St. David's Station and I was out uh, on eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. And then we couldn't be on the train. The supporters were on the platform. Was anyone there? Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. What was your memory of that? Sorry? What was your memory of going down to Hoop? The game was, well, I don't think either side was particularly were chasing it, let's put it that way. Oh, you were at, you were at Workington? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. The other side was chasing it. Was it Alan Barnett? Who was the keeper? Alan Barnett. Alan Barnett. Alan Barnett. Alan Barnett. Alan Barnett. I think he had about one save to make. I think I'm on the guard. Maybe one side, one save to make, and that was the way it was. And either side, but they were really going for it. So, yeah. and it should everybody really didn't make any difference. But the atmosphere was tremendous, really. It was fantastic. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. 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 It's funny because in the 58-59 season, City's last game, final game, was away to Shrewsbury, mm -hmm. and City only needed a point to get promoted. That was in Frankie Broom's first season as manager. And City lost three 0 at Shrewsbury, and they hit City by a point to get promoted. So oh, there's no question then of yeah. any stalemate. So it just makes you wonder whether or not they came to some sort of <laughs> gentleman's <laughs> agreement. Yeah. Well, when we uh, obviously when we got back to um, into Exeter, obviously the supporters were all, all over the place. And on the uh, Wednesday, for playing at the final of the Devon Bowl <laughs> against Plymouth Argyle. Yeah. They absolutely slaughtered them. One for one. And after the game, there was two supporters invited us to go to the Buckle Lodge Hotel for dinner, have a slap up meal, and as, and as much as you wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one was, um, yeah, two, two supporters, and, and we went to the Buckle Lodge, Buckle Lodge and had a, a row. Slap up me and there's a photograph there, Alan, of oh. um, you filling the Devon Bowl up with champagne with um, oh. Seth Smith. Yeah, not you. <laughs> no, you <laughs> yeah, but, but, but then, not you. That was that was the end. That was the end of the, the season then. You yeah, know, that's your end of season two in the bit. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was yeah. that yeah. he contested the Devon Bowl because it's now known as the St Luke's St Luke's yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. But what uh, I would say <laughs> was, uh, yes. I was rather fortunate to play with some really, really good players. Mm -hmm. But that was the best side I played in. And it's it. So can they get that actually into Orgo, Orgo was second division. They, they were in the second That's it. And, and there was probably a bigger crowd than that night that was out last night. Well, in actual fact, John Newman played in that mm -hmm. game. 
I mean, there's nothing obviously one thing got from motion, and there's a match. And then we all the supporters turned up to see it and playing our goal from the second division. And like Adam said, City actually destroyed them and won 4 1. So, can anyone remember coming to meet the train when it came back that Sunday morning? I did. I just wondered if anyone else. I was there, but I, I didn't get in, into the station. There were so many people. Because you had to buy a plat platform ticket out there. Yeah. 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 And there was so many people, and, and it was a Sunday morning, and Sundays back in those days, completely different. Sunday was a day of rest, and people laid on in bed, and you know, it was generally quiet, no buses, but there was, a, there was a really big crowd down there. And like I spoke to other people, I'd never could believe it, so many people on a Sunday morning down here, and obviously the team came out, and all cheering, and I can't remember whether they had a bus or a ride up the town or anything. I think the cops got lots of photographs taken outside when they came out of the station, out onto the, yeah, uh, the, the frontage of St. David's. I think there's quite a lot of room with Dave Hancock and uh, some of the other lads having their pictures taken outside. You know? it, was, um, it, was, it was chaotic, I remember. <laughs> People forget that Torquay yeah. were in the same league and they had an outside chance of getting promoted. And I remember playing against them over Easter in 64. And we played them here and we drew nil nil. And there were 16 and a half thousand. Yeah. That, that's, that's the biggest league crowd I've played in here. Mm -hmm. And then, that, was on the, that was on the Good Friday. And they played, we played the return leg on the Easter Monday at Plainmore here, yeah. when they had over 13,000. Can you believe this? That's all key. Over 13,000. And we drew one more. Yeah. Then we came to school. Yeah. Yes. And they, I mean, and they had a good side. They had um, a guy from called Bob and Stubbs. Yeah. 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 And Tommy Northcott, you know, a uh, good side. But yet, no, they didn't get the one. His wife was on the red for That's right, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. For the generation yeah. going in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think promotion meant to your dad? Were, were you too young to, come, um, to pick it up, or did he ever talk about it? He always talked about it. Oh. Oh. Excellent yeah. was his life. That's all he talked about at home. Um, and he was a very proud Yorkshireman, and he was very proud to be captain of Exeter City, his adopted city. Mm. You know, coming from Yorkshire, and you know, to, to the day he died, he only about, ever, I think he went back about three or four times, mainly to funerals and, and, and to visit relatives, but this was his adopted hometown, and he was very honoured and proud to be captain of Exeter City, and to be the first captain to uh, take the club up into the third division, the first time it had happened in the city's history, you know, so, uh, he, never let, he never let me forget it, to be oh, honest. Well, that's <laughs> I'll tell you the story about the army, which is, is, is very sad in actual fact, is that when Arnie left the club, he, he didn't really know he was, he was leaving. I mean, he was called into the boardroom and told him that they need, they didn't need him anymore. <clears throat> Over there, there used to be a, a, a wall and he used to have, he used to be, a, Used to be lockers and used to put your boots in there. And I, in actual fact, it was that I was going to sign for Plymouth Argyle. And uh, Arnie came out of the boardroom, went to, the lock, went to his locker, picked his boots up, and walked out the canal. Mm. That, was the, that was the end of Arnie. Not a thank you, nothing at all. No. Not even a testimony. <clears throat> and I know for a, for a fact that it took Arnie over 20 odd years mm. for him to come back here mm. to see him again. Alan, was there <coughs> any reason why the club didn't give him a testimony? No, 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 I didn't. I, no, I didn't. I, no, I just seemed strange because uh, lot lot of players players did, you know, what it was did. What he always said to me was that Jock Basford, who was the manager at the time, and I don't like to say, but Dad didn't call him Basford. Um, <laughs> he came from Child Athletic, and he brought with him four players from Child Athletic. 
and Dad had found out that they were on a higher wage than he was on, and he went in to see, I think it was Fred Dark, Mr. Dark, one of the directors, yeah. and he asked for a pay rise, pound a week pay rise, and he was shown the door. And I think after that, Dad lost a little bit. His final season, he only played 19 games. And he asked for a free transfer, and he was turned down. They refused him a transfer. Um, and I'm not saying he left under a bit of a cloud, but he, he, he always held, he always said to me as, as a lad, as a teenager, he always used to repeat the same thing. I owe that club nothing, they owe me everything. And he, mm -hmm. and he really referred to the directors at the time. Mm -hmm. And as I've said to maybe some of you tonight and other people, Dad never, well, he very rarely came back to the ground for, for matches. He used to bring me up as a, my grandfather used to bring me up as a season ticket holder for donkey's years. Mm -hmm. And it was my granddad that used to bring me up. My dad never used to bring me up. And the only time he would come back to the park was at an evening game under floodlights when it was dark. Mm -hmm. And we always walked to the ground and we came in the Kendall Gate, yeah. which is now Stadium Way. And he always used to, we, we never got here for kickoff. We were always late, and the lads used to turn around, uh, fans used to turn around and say, bloody late again, Arnold. He was always late, he never got here for kickoff. And he, used to, he was quite happy to paint the turnstiles. But he always used to stand on the big bank at the top where the old concrete toilet block used to be. He, ne he never wanted to be seen or recognised. And as Alan said, it took him a lot of time. Um, it, in actual fact, it was me that wasn't back. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, and, and even in his later life, I can remember the very last time he came here, and obviously he was suffering at the time with um, dementia and memory loss. Uh, he came up, he, walk, he always walked up to the ground from his home in Chancellor's Way in Beacon Heath. And he came up, my mother said that he'd left, got out of his seat at half time and walked home. Mm. Because he didn't really know probably why he was here or why he'd come back to the ground. Mm. I'm not saying he fell out of love with the city because the city, he always looked for the results, but on a, on a, on a Saturday afternoon after he retired, um, he used to sit and watch the horse racing on Grandstand, always. And it was four races on BBC, then it was probably the ITV7 on ITV. And then he used to sit and watch the um, rugby league with Eddie Waring, the second half of the rugby league, every Saturday afternoon. But he always used to look out for the city's results. Um, and, and I think he always, I'm not saying he held it against the club, but he certainly held it against certain individuals, possibly the manager, Jock Bassford, mm -hmm. and possibly uh, one or two of the directors. And I think because of that, he was never afforded a testimonial, mm -hmm. which, you know, he didn't want to make anything out. He, he had a fantastic life, he had a wonderful career here, he had 14 happy years here. Uh, the best days of his life, he always said to me, but he always left with that little tinge of sadness. Mm -hmm. and, and it took him a long, a long time to get over it. It really did. And uh, you know, obviously, Dad kept in contact with past players, and a lot of players used to come back to the house. Les McDonald used to. He went and moved away up, um, up to Waterloo, Mill Hamlet, yeah, or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, and Phil, being my godfather, and uh, he married my mother's best yeah. friend. Phil would always pop in, so they yeah, always used to come back to the house. Always used to return to the house. But he used to find it very, very difficult to come back to the park to watch games. I'm not really surprised that a friend of mine was playing at that time for the club, and he told me about the same story. You know, leaving the club carrying boots. Yeah. You know, eight, 14 to 16 years of service, walking out the club carrying boots. Yeah. You know, he was dedicated to it. He was. I'm not saying he was a man's man, but he put his heart and soul into it. Mm. And as I said earlier, he was always. I, I always knew him as a shouter. He always used to shout, he used to shout at me at home, and he, he was a bit of a disciplinarian in some respects because, you know, he'd never let us walk around the house in stocking feet, we'd have to put carpet slippers on, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and all I wanted to do was play football and, and follow my father's footsteps, and I wanted to be as good as he was and nothing at all, so I took up golf. <laughs> um, but he, he, he never really came to watch me play either. No. He, he came on a handful of occasions, and he only ever gave me two pieces of advice. He said, son, make the first tackle count, let him know you're there. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, if he puts his head in the way, don't disappoint him, kick the bugger off. Uh, yeah, That's what he used yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but was, he, was he a hard man? Yeah. On the field? Uh, well, well no, I'm not saying hard. Was, he, was, he was very enthusiastic. And he expected, if he gave 100%, he wanted the players around him to give 100%. But he used to, we, we had many disagreements and arguments on the golf course. He used to nag, nag, nag. And he'd always tell people how to grip the club and what to do, but it was his enthusiasm, because all he ever wanted you to do was to do your best, to perform to your best ability, and I'm sure he was like that as captain of Exeter City. He That's was, all he wanted. Yeah, he was, you know? 
he, he, you know, the, the, the people looked up, looked up to Arnie as, <coughs> as, as, as a gentleman. Arnie is always first, always first in the testament. As David said, he always wore a collar and tie. Yeah. Nothing else. He was always first in the dressing room. He was first on the training pitch. And he was always last off. Mm -hmm. And you could always go to him and ask him. And he would give you a, an honest answer. And you couldn't ask for anybody. And he used to like to take a drink, as a lot of the players did. Oh, yeah. But he'd always be first in for training the following mm -hmm. morning. Yeah. Always. And his second home was the Georgian Dragon. You know, yeah. that's where he used to live, you know. Yeah. But he was, he was here 14 years. 14, yeah. yeah. I thought you always got a testimony after 10 years. He, he had a benefit match oh, along with Keith Harvey, I think 1957. And I've got the receipts for the... Um, the, 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 the club paid him in instalments. Mm. <laughs> um, and I think he had £250 and they paid, they paid him in instalments. As they did, the club did a, a lot, they paid, a, even, they paid you, did, or they paid Cambridge and Liverpool, because they had to pay both clubs, didn't they? Yeah, they paid both clubs, yeah. And I'm sure they paid £500 here, and they paid in instalments. Mind you, that still happens. Swansea yeah. pay, pay yeah. us for yeah. grinding. Yeah. 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 The thing was, then, it was a ma minimum or maximum wage. Yeah. And I had friends of mine who played up here at Dave Hancock, and they, and they, it showed me our contracts, like back in the 50s, yeah. and I think it was something like seven pound a week playing, yeah. and three pounds something a week in the summer. Yeah, because they, they, they were put to work as well, they had contracts, they had, well, that's, that's what, they, But they only played that in the reserve team, for yeah. Dave Ancos came from Torquay, but other boys I knew, like Dave Robinson and Mike Cleverley, and boys of my age and that, that played for the city. And I mean, so what the contracts they bring out? You think, here's my contract, that's seven pounds a week. Like, what's Rooney getting? <laughs> Dad's first contract was eight pounds a week. But of course, they, they were paid six pounds a week in the close season, but they were made to work. They used to go lumberjacking on the top of the hole. Oh, yeah. And they used to go sweeping and sand off the sea for an axe. They did get differential pay. I mean, your dad would have been on the top grade because he's first team. Yeah, they got and extra. The second, they, the second team would be third team. <laughs> Not. Yeah, that's one of his later contracts, and that was uh, oh, 1955. That's oh, what second or third contract. And what was he on? He was on ten pounds a week. Oh, that's yeah, that's that's too, much. too much. Too much. <laughs> 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 uh, two pounds a week bonus if you played in the first team. Because mm, yeah. of course the reserves played in the Southern League, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So, any questions for Alan and David? Yeah, yeah no. Carry on. Carry on. Go on, Matt. Go on, then, Mike. I think it would be not inaccurate to say that, that in, in a lot of cases, Edson and Sydney's track record of, of treating players like Arnold, like Jimmy Charles, Jack Edwards, etc., leaves a lot to be desired. Is there no a change with the club's approach to people like yourself, Tyler? etc. That they are beginning to recognise and, and acknowledge your contribution to the club's history. Do you, do you feel do you feel more valued now by FCSC? I think um, I think it, I think football has changed an awful lot. And for me personally, I think it's checked for the worst. Oh, yeah. I do, honestly. I mean, I despise it sometimes when I, you read things in the paper one about players and clubs and everything else, you know. But go back to, go to and honestly, <coughs> Exorcist is my club. It's your club. Without you people here, without you people, we wouldn't have a club. We literally would not have a club if we didn't stop coming. Fans paid the wages, didn't they? I mean, <coughs> totally, you, you, can, you can sign players, but you can't sign supporters. Mm -hmm. Once the supporters stop coming, this club will become nowhere to go. Yeah. Yeah. But, but as far as uh, your question, Mike, I mean, once 
uh, the likes. We'll hear every week. There's eight or nine of us ex-players: Jimmy Charles, to be playing, Bob Wilson, John Dell, Johnny Hall, um, Len Bond. It's a hat yourself. We're here week in and week out. Once we go, that'll be the finish. There's no link to the past. Like there won't be any link at all. Because we have all, we are all set up in Exeter, and we are true Exeter City supporters. A lot of the players, well, I can't, can't say about for a lot of the players, but some of the players, obviously, don't live in Exeter. Quite a few of them live outside the city. Some of them travel in from Bristol <coughs> to train. And that's why I think um, the link between the present day players and the supporters is not as nowhere near as good as our, my, myself and other players links with the supporters here. And I think, which is which is sad, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I just I just feel that the football itself has. Football itself has gone away from the genuine supporters. But I think, I think every club, sorry, every club's experiencing that though anyway, isn't it? Because yeah. they're not, they're not men of the people anymore. It's all no. corporate business. No. Uh, you know, you'll probably all agree that there's too much money involved in football, but that's the market forces dictate that. Yeah. But um, I think in your day, in Dad's day, and you go back to the twenties, the thirties, and the forties. Exeter was their home club, and a lot of lads came through the, the, the local ranks, and they played at youth level, junior level, locally within within the city. You don't get quite so much of that now. Even the academy players are coming from outside outside of the town, and, and I think it's important. And, and historically, you look back at um, the board, not just at this club but other football clubs, and there's always background disagreements. There's always issues in the background amongst directors and chairman, etc., etc. And to some degree, there still is in this day and age. But with the amount of money that's flowing into the game now, I think it's the fans have become more and more um, separated from the players. There's, that, there's no contact anymore. You wouldn't see a modern day player, probably at, at all levels in, in, in the football leagues, mixing and socialising out of work, out of the workplace, out of, out of, out of the football environment. They, they don't do that anymore. And I think maybe market forces have dictated that as well. Um, but I, I think through what you're trying to do here, trying to achieve here, through the <coughs> history group and, and you know, the, the senior reds, etc., I think there is that link still with the past. And I think sometimes when I speak to people and they say, oh, your dad never got a testimony after 14 years' service. But that's the way it was then. And I think it's slightly different now in that players are recognised for many achievements because of social media, because of the, the coverage they got on TV. Um, I mean, I've never, seen, I've never seen moving pictures of my dad play. I've seen moving pictures of Alan scoring against Man United on January the 4th, 1969, Dennis and James were event, because it's endorsed. Um, and, and, and you can relate to that, but I think of, of days gone by, you don't have those moving images anymore. And I think because of that, um, today's modern day players, um, it's all done to social media and, and what I, I know when you come to games nowadays you're expecting to see an action replay up on yes, the score. Yes, because yeah. yeah. if you miss it, if you have sat by the colours in the old grandstand, you don't see the ball go in the net. You expect to see it come up on the screen as an action replay and you don't get that. You know. Yeah. Uh, Phil, you've been asking yeah. questions. Touching on that, I want to say about train travel and David Bennett is definitely aware of all the time. I'm surprised that still in the early sixties you would have given up rail travel, considering that it's pre-motorway, it must take you days to get to well, the north of England by coach, wouldn't it? So. I'll give you an example. 63, there were absolutely no motorways at all. We, used to, if we had to go to, uh, say, place Stockport in Manchester. We would leave here at half past eight on a Friday morning. Then we would have to go through uh, uh, all the places, uh, Taunton, yeah. um, whatever, before, our first stop would be Bristol Airport two hours later for a cup of coffee. <laughs> then we would have to try, um, we would make our way then to Gloucester 
for lunch. And then after that, we would then travel from Gloucester to Manchester. And we would not get there, I'm telling you, so maybe six or half past six at night. And we've left at half past eight in the morning. And we said, it used to be on the old A38 from here right through to Bristol. We had to try and get through <coughs> Bristol. Then we try and get through Wolverhampton. And uh, then to Manchester. I've actually got a newspaper cutting there from the Echo, whereby Exeter City stopped paying train fares. There's a, there's a full front page um, article in the Echo where the club had paid something like 32 or 36 pounds to take the entire team, plus trainers, directors, manager, kit men. They couldn't afford to do that. So what they did, they had a, a coach converted so that the players could sit opposite each other, so they had a table so they could play cards. They couldn't afford to pay the train fares. And that was in the 60s, early 60s. And there's photographs in some of the papers with them stood on a cruise station waiting for about two or three hours for a connection. You know, gone are the days, you, know, you never flew in your life, Alan, did you, as a, as a footballer? Did you ever fly? I uh, flew a football. Did you? Yeah. But not with the city. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you say, we? That photo was 1960 before we were Yes, yes. Yeah. So it was something like 30 odd pounds, wasn't it? And the club yeah. couldn't afford the 30 yeah. And the second class road tickets, and they couldn't afford to send the team and the players, so they had a coach converted, hired a coach. Yeah. And they couldn't afford the fee. Yeah. I remember one away, one away trip, and we're playing, of an evening game, and we're playing at Hartley Pools. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the, I'm oh. telling you, that is the worst place you want to go to in, the, in winter. <sighs> the wind is blown off. Oh, I'm going to I'm not telling you where they were lying. They had a bat, and I'm telling you, it was no bigger than that. <laughs> and it's the only time I thought, oh, the, oh, the magic takes me off. Literally, <laughs> that's what it was, yeah. And I've, we've, we've called it, let, we've let Holly Paul say 11, half past 11 at night. And now we've been, going, we've been going round and round about at Palace Street st bus station at half past ten the following morning. Oh. Oh. Honestly, what's on the way to my It's no wonder you never used to win away in those days. That. Yeah, that's what it was like. In, in, in the hot winter. He shouts it though. Yeah, yeah. 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 In, the winter, in the winter of 62 63, when I think it was a blizzard, the city played away at Stockport County. And they lost 4 3. And they caught the train, they, I think they left Manchester Piccadilly at midnight and they got back to Exeter nine hours later. And they got caught in blizzards. But do you know what? During that, they actually went and played, I think the blizzard was um, Boxing Day, and then the city played one match at home against Oldham Athletic, and that was on the, almost two months later, on the 23rd of February. And they then played at home on the 9th of March against Hartlepool United, because I can tell you a very quick story. Dad, they, the players always had to report to the ground when they had a home game. And it, I think there was eight inches of snow and three inches of ice underneath there in that, in that severe winter. And Dad used to report to the ground, and as I said, he played the one game home to, um, to Oldham Athletic. And he always used to report, then he used to go and meet my mother's cousin, who was a Marine at CTC Limstone. And they used to meet in the Greyhound for lunch and a few bevies. And he was in there one Saturday afternoon. For some reason, Ray told, my Uncle Ray told me, as I call it, uh, that Dad, for some reason, never reported to the ground. And Dad had had six or seven pints. And this little lad came in and he said, well, not playing today then, Arnold. He said, well, no. He said, well, the game's on. They cleared the snow off the pitch. <laughs> and it was on the 9th of March. And my Uncle Ray remembered that it was one of the best games that he ever saw Dad play. And he had six or seven points. And they won three, one at home. <coughs> But they, they, they played in Stockport County and it took them nine hours to get back on that night. They had severe blizzards. I think it was on Boxing Day. Because they always used to play Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Yeah, they right. yes. yes. oh, they, they get a bit frightened on that Boxing Day. I remember catching the bus to the ground and the snow started because I was catching the bus about one o'clock to yeah. get in that day. And it was about a regular day. It was a nil nil. So it was an old wind goal. Yeah. It was a big bang. It breaks on my memory for some reason. Well, that was the end of football for months.
Yeah. So just we'll, we'll, we'll start drawing things to a close and then we can all have uh, informal discussions and, and chats. But be because we've got this um, project about St James's Park, I just wanted David first, if you could just share what, what the stadium means to you and what you think it meant to your dad as a, as a player. My dad came down here um, in 1952. Um, caught the train, never been to Exeter before in his life. All the time from St David Station, signed on the dotted line. Exeter City was in his blood. I was weaned on Exeter City football. As, as I said, I sat on my mother's knee from the age of three. Is that um, the, the old grandstand? Precisely? That's the old grandstand, yeah. yeah. Obviously the old cow shed was on this side of the stadium. And then, as I said, my grandfather used to bring up as a season ticket holder. And I then sat in the main grandstand as a season ticket holder with my grandfather. And then I used to come up with my sort of school pals. Never used to miss a game. Uh, had my first cigarette on the big bank. Um, <laughs> meant, meant for cigarettes, her dad could smell the cigarette. Um, and, and, and it meant everything to me. I, I lived for Exeter City Football Club. Um, and it was only, as I said, as, as I grew older and my dad started talking more, more about it meant more to me. I didn't realise what he meant to Exeter and to the people of Exeter and to Exeter City Football Club and the sterling service that he gave this club. Um, and, and I'm very happy to be involved uh, and pass on some of, his, uh, some of his memories to fans that maybe saw him play or didn't see him play. And I think it's nice to keep the legacy going with the likes of Alan, because there's very few of the 63, 64 promotion side left. Poor old Les McDonald passed away. Um, I think um, yes. Keith's still obviously fit and healthy. Great Reese is still fit yeah, and healthy. Uh, I think this, I think this six of them have passed away at that mm. particular. Uh, and, and there's very few links with that promotion winning side. Well, there will, uh, the, the, there will be links um, with this project, which Gabriella is doing. Yeah. This will be um, be done sometime next season with uh, Paul Foley, with Graham, with with, uh, uh, with Keith, uh, also Graham Reese. Yes, I spoke to Paul today on the phone, and he's he's trying to get he's hoping to get Graham Reese and Keith back. That'll be for next season. Yes, yeah. I mean I you know mother knew Keith for the period of time that she knew Dad and, and Mary. Is it Mary his wife? It is Mary, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I'd like to speak to Keith because he was you know he was one of my heroes. As was Alan. Mm -hmm. As was latterly Jimmy Giles and Peter Hatch. They were guys that were heroes of mine as I grew up. Um, and I can remember dear old Jimmy Blaine working for Mr. Softy Ice Cream in the summer. He always used to pull up outside Dad's house and give me a free ice cream. <laughs> These are the guys that I used to worship as, as a young lad growing up. You know. So it wasn't the football, it was the corgi toys. And yeah. the yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's all I wanted to be, isn't it? I always wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. I was never good enough. I, I played for excellent schools and different schools, but I, I was never good enough to follow in his footsteps. And I can see why now. Um, he wasn't the most talented of, of, of footballers, but he gave 110%. And he expected everybody that played alongside him. All right, he might have nagged, he might have shouted at them all the time, but he, he wanted them to play their best, to do the best for his football club. Brilliant. And Alan, what, what does this place mean to you, this stadium, this ground? Um, when the manager of Cambridge, Cambridge City said to me, he said, um, Exeter City, I made a bid for you, he said, do you fancy going? And I said, I said, and he said, oh, it's in Devon. I said, oh, I said, oh, I said, oh, right. So what, I think about it, the day I, the day I left to come down here, we left Cambridge, when the weather was absolutely fine. It was raining and drizzly and, Wife and I were well wrapped up and everything else, you know. And we, and we went, um, got the train from Cambridge to, uh, to London and, and got the Paddington train from Paddington to Exeter. And of course, you know, the, about an, an half an hour, we got to, to, to Taunton, I think. So, oof, there was some here. <laughs> got it into Exeter and we, and we stopped at, um, we got off the central station. And we were met by uh, Mr. Les Kersling, who was a, a director here, met us. And it was based on absolutely rogue stuff. I mean, oh, this is all right. So anyway, the 
the, Mr. Kay's like took us to, to the, took us to the ground, and we were all with them, and they all grandstand there, took us in the boardroom, and obviously talked, uh, contact talks and everything, you know. So uh, I wasn't very happy what, what they offered me, and <coughs> so we we said, well, you know, that one meet following day. He said, well, while they're here, he said, I'll just show you, I'll drive you around the area the next day. So he took us to, this, this is uh, about the middle of October, 63, and he took us to Exmouth. And we just couldn't believe it. There was people, no only beach or twice along the safe road, but people were sunbathing outside the resorts. And my friend, I thought, I can't believe this. <laughs> so obviously, that was it, and then um, we, the, Mr. Kids later, he took us out to dinner uh, that evening, and then the following day, we went back to the ground, agreed terms, and signed. Uh, then, 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 but I mean, I've, we've, we've been there ever since. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been there now over 50 odd years, absolutely loving, lovely parts of the country, mm -hmm. and next to the city. It's my club. It's your club, and I, you know, and, and I, we, with the rest of the other players, we just enjoy coming here, you know, week in and <coughs> week in. I mean, games are alright, some games are bad, we have a few drinks and think about, you know, and we all obviously all talk about when we were playing and sometimes we should have been that bad there again. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, <coughs> Exeter City is my club. And uh, you know, I've, I've loved every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Been here. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that's brilliant. Well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. both of you, for mm -hmm. sharing those mm -hmm. memories. Mm -hmm. I think that's been absolutely fascinating for us all. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll um, yeah, we can all gather yeah. around and yeah. have personal yeah. conversations and look yeah. at the wonderful yeah. stuff. I'm quite happy to answer any questions. Anybody's got any questions? I'm um, just going to wrap it up. So hopefully, maybe somebody can fill me in with some of the players. Yeah, well, I'm sure Trevor can. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we used to work. To, well, you, before you were told, you worked at RDNA. I do. Well, yeah, always, that's a lockdown now. Yeah, we never knew that I was on some stuff. Oh, the dirty, not my kind of what you think. I got told that I got told that the books they signed on and go. Hang on, it's going to be like when I was at school. I'm going to get in the team. <laughs> so I did sign, but the double of them did. Um, I've always considered Alan to be Mr. X of the city. Oh, he is. Because he Alan has always, Alan, and and he's he's always cool. stayed connected to this club. Yeah. And he was even playing for our side football well into his 70s, Alan. Yes. <laughs> 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 and and, and he's always been Mr. X of the city for me. And he was one of my heroes when I was a kid. You know, so. no, I mean, this is an app. Alan used to play five side football with the, the, the likes of us, right? Yeah. And you know, they have a legendary football yeah. were playing. Yeah. You know, you're in, you're in see big and sheer. A lot of the old guys <laughs> used to play in a Wednesday football league. You know, that's it. That's it. Your dad did. Mm -hmm. Billy, Billy Dunlop, George Willis, Roger King. Yeah. They used to play in the yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. Used to play in a Wednesday yeah. football league, didn't they? And I think a lot of the pros, a lot of the retired pros have, and it's, what surprises me about a lot of them is that they've always stayed in the area. Mm -hmm. They've loved it so much, they've Her. stayed in Exeter, or in and around Exeter, John Dell, Peter Hatch, they've never wanted to go home. No, they've all, all stayed here, yeah. yeah. I think Bill and Mike wants to yeah. start. Yeah, I, I was just going to uh, reiterate what Martin said, thank you both David <laughs> and Alan. Fascinating evening, I'm sure we've all enjoyed it. Plenty to remember, plenty to learn as well. Um, really worthwhile, thank you. I'd like to also please ask you to show your appreciation to Martin, who's chaired the meeting so much. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to um, bring up Mike. Mike organised this evening. Um, excellent all the way through. Michael, can I hand it over to you now? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
It's, it's been an amazing evening. It's been nostalgia at its very best. To us here this evening, it's been a special night. I won't be controversial, I'll be diplomatic for me. All I will say to the people who aren't here tonight have missed a unique evening. Yeah. 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 And, and I hope, and I hope they find out what a special evening it's been. Um, a quick one to, to Alan so that you can perhaps um, give it some thought. But we've been approached by Exeter City, David and I, that we've been invited to form some sort of um, organisation where basically David and I will, with the ex-players, which I read with myself and Hanson, John, Keith Banks, etc. Um, we would like to work with you and, and, and keep this unique relationship going because I don't think it will ever happen again in our lifetime. I think the current players will come off to other clubs and we probably will never see them again. You are the fabric of this this club. Even David and Nun Lane, I mean he's his late dad was a legend. And amongst other amongst other legends Mike. Held, yeah. held in the highest esteem with with Alan, with Jimmy, etc. All equally <coughs> legends. So we would we would like to do something, David and I, with the legends. Name of various social events, etc. Yeah. Well, you, you know, we are we are always interested in trying to help the club in any in, in any way we, we can. And as I said, you know, uh, I'm here. I would just like to thank you for inviting me here, Jim, um, to, to show my oh, uh, what it's like That's right. uh, as a player, and obviously now I am here now as a supporter. Um, you know, so, uh, so it will also be a way Alan, of us showing our appreciation mm. to all of yeah. you for what you've given to us in our lifetime. Right, before I start getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I'm a very average gardener and, and I was down there yesterday turning over the soil. It's affectionately known by my sons as mud. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was down in the shed and, and I hope that's not talking about it. And I was looking through some bits and pieces and I saw this pile of books with cobwebs on and God knows what. And I thought it would be a tangible way of actually giving you and, and David something which I hope will be special to you. I know I gave you a book which had a quite a bit of stuff with, with Tom Finney, which I know is your idol. Um, I couldn't find anything with as much about Tom Finney, but the, um, um, on behalf of us all, uh, I would like you to receive this with our greatest respect, affection and esteem, and, and hope that you enjoy that. And and to David. David and I go back perhaps 50, 60 years in a sports train when they used to inflate footballs and lace them up with leather, uh, etc. And I know David, before we do uh, break up and comes and it falls so we get together. David wants to speak about something which is very, very passionate um, to him in particular, um, which we'd be honoured to hear. Um, Dave, thanks for all the time you've Pleasure given. You, give. you know, this hasn't happened overnight. David and I have been communicating about this 
Um, it came up the house last week when I was trying to watch West Ham from Man United. He didn't stop bloody talking. But we saw the door. I said, you what, it's not like his dad. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think your darling wife would like it if I like myself. I think I upset you that night, didn't I? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you missed the goals. But, but Dave, yeah. thank you. Thank you ever so much for, sure. for everything that you've, you've brought to us. Um, I hope you enjoy that. I will do, Michael. I thank think, you. I'll share with Mother. I think that will be special because I think the person that you've already mentioned tonight figures prominently in that. I'd like you to open it so perhaps people can see this. You know, they're probably invited. Right I hope there. there's no cobwebs. There's no. <laughs> I cleaned them off at the oh, house. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Can, can I just say very briefly, I used to work in John Webber Sports and that's where you started, wasn't it, John Webber's? Yeah, well, went to Wessex. Yeah. But Mike ended up with Alan in X-Sports in the Guildhall Precinct. Yeah. And we were arch enemies, Webber's in X-Sports. <laughs> and Alan used to string rackets, didn't you? Because yeah. you were still looking over. Alan used to sneak into the shop with pen and paper. He always used to note down the prices. <laughs> 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 So uh, we go back a long way in the sports trade as well. Can I just say thank you ever so much. It's very kind of you to invite me and David. And as I said, thank you. I'm sure when I speak to the other ex-players, I'm sure they would only be too happy to sort of come along and sort of try and uh, entertain you. Uh, well, Michael, I think David and I did. Really? Okay. Really? Can, I, can, I just, uh, can I just like to say as well, I'd like to thank Gabriella and Will and yeah. uh, Martin and Paul Farley, who um, set out on this course to try and digitalise and collate all the... Oh, fantastic. Dad played with Tommy Lawton at Orange County, and he's a man very dear to my heart. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to thank all the hard work that the university team, Gabriella and, and with Martin and Will, etc., uh, have put in. Um, they, they're creating this um, historical record of Exeter City Football Club, which I think, hopefully, when the new grandstand is eventually built, there's going to be a museum dedicated to players past and present. Um, I've been glad to get involved initially at uh, uh, um, early days. Um, unfortunately, Mother's not very well at the moment. She's unfortunately going down the same route that Father went down. Um, so I've not been able to put as much time or any time to it like I, I'd wish to do so. Um, so I'd like to thank, on behalf of Exeter City Football Club and past players, what these kind people are doing for this football club. Because I think without um, the past being remembered and all the historical facts being collated that a lot of people and, uh, and, and records will fade into the distant past mm -hmm. and I'd like to thank them all from the bottom of my heart for what they've done. I'd like to thank the club for this invite and the uh, senior Reds for inviting me this evening. Um, I went to a meeting um, I think with you and Paul Farley and I was amazed that there's no Players Association at Exeter City Football Club and I think it would be nice to connect players that have represented this club both in good times and in bad to come back to socialise with maybe some of the fans and to have evenings and gatherings like this mm -hmm. and I think, I think that that would bode well for the future of this football club that the past is kept very much in the present so I'd like to thank you all very much indeed for what you've done and what you're all hoping to achieve in, in, in later days so Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back and have a look at the memorabilia on the personal questions. Uh, yeah. the... I was just going to say something uh, that the club or Mike's asked me tonight. If there's any monies raised tonight, um, I'd like it to go to, to Dementia UK. It, it's obviously a subject that's very close to my heart. Not only regarding Dad, but dear old Dermot Curtis. I, I went to school with Morris's son and we've obviously compared notes during and after our father's deaths. And I know um, recent um, headlines, both in newspapers and on the television, regarding some of the old England World Cup 66 squad, Martin Peters, Nobby Styles, 
Um, <coughs> and Ray Wilson, uh, it's been brought to the public's attention again. <coughs> the, the FA have known about um, head trauma for over 40 years now, and I think because of the litigation that's been levied against um, American NFL players, <coughs> they're, they're, they're concerned that um, families and relatives will be seeking compensation for um, what's been described as an industrial illness. Uh, I've been in contact with Dawn Astle, who's Jeff Astle's Jeff Astle used to play for England and West Bromwich Albion. He died in 2002, um, and he had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is, I believe, uh, there's over a hundred forms of dementia, and it's very, very close to her heart. She formed the Jeff Astle Foundation. She approached Greg Dyke, the chairman of the FA, and about 14 months ago, and he was going to in investigate or help set up research into um, the hundreds of ex-professional footballers in this country that have, have suffered with um, Alzheimer's, dementia, etc. Um, it's now been passed into the hands of FIFA, and obviously FIFA have been going through this very traumatic episode fairly recently. And the response from FIFA was, what do we need to know about this for now? I, I think the game's obviously got a lot faster, the game, the ball's got a lot lighter, the players are a lot fitter. But there are over 250 families involved in the Jeff Astral, uh, Jeff Astral Trust. Um, I was put in contact with a gentleman called uh, Jeff Twentyman, who used to play for Bristol Rovers. And he's now a BBC radio presenter in Bristol. And Paul Farley very kindly sent me the information and they did a small piece on a BC West Inside Out programme. And Jeff Twentyman uh, has looked into this because one of his colleagues from Bristol Rovers, from his time at Bristol Rovers, died in 2013 at the age of 55 from Pick's disease, which has been caused by um, uh, punch drunk syndrome, I think they call it, uh, which is likened to boxers being punch drunk, the continual uh, brain damage and trauma that, that the old players have suffered from having the old leather footballs. And I, I think um, it obviously won't come to light um, until many years down the line, but I think that modern day players should um, be informed of what's gone on in the past. And I know for a fact that when my father was presented with that, leather 18 panel football from John Webber's Falls. He used to take me down to the Beaconing school field and he used to say some, put your head through it, it's only a bag of wind, it's not gonna hurt you. And some of the old professional footballers used to spend hours and hours playing head tennis. You know, tens of thousands of times they came in contact with the old leather footballs and as you probably knew as youngsters, when the balls got wet, they got very heavy. And they used to make you physically sick. Um, and as I say, it's, it's an area that I'm quite passionate about. None of the families are seeking compensation, but I think that the, that the authorities, the powers that be, need to recognise that this is an issue. When the coroner's inquest was held into Jeff Astle's death in, in 2002, uh, on the coroner's report, the cause of death was um, through heading leather footballs and industrial disease. And I think that the football powers that be, with the millions of pounds they've got in their coffers, seriously need to look at the link between the past and forms of dementia and Alzheimer's that are now affecting lots of old professional footballers, but also lots of amateur footballers that suffered uh, the same consequences. So if any monies are raised from tonight's evening, I'd like it to go to Dementia UK on behalf of you and on behalf of Exeter City Football Club and the Senior Reds. Thank you very much. But also the club, the trust, and the football and the community charity have all agreed to join the Exeter Dementia Action Alliance. Master. And in fact, tomorrow, uh, 10:30, we've got a dementia awareness training session for staff and for volunteers. If anyone wants to come to that, they'd be very welcome. I'd love to come. Yeah, well, 10:30 yeah, yes. um, in the Grecian Centre. 
Yeah, I'll be here. Thank, thank you. Great you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's uh, really, it's an issue of our time, yes, and it's great that the club are uh, taking it very seriously. So, thanks again, um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening in Portland. Thank you.